the publishing industry. Please welcome Phil Weiser, CTO at Hearst. Kevin Conroy, President, Digital and Enterprise Development at Univision Communications Incorporated Studios. And a warm welcome for our moderator, Michaela O'Connor Abrams, President at Dwell Media. Welcome, everybody. Um, you know, this is uh, a daunting task to talk about the future uh, of the publishing industry. Um, we could do an entire day on this topic. But we have 40 minutes, and I want to make sure that we leave time for you to an, um, ask questions of my distinguished uh, panelists. In your book, it says that there are four of us. We do not have anybody shy and high, hiding behind the curtain. Um, we had uh, one person, David Payne of Gannett, uh, become ill. So you have the pleasure of the three of us. And what we're going to talk about is the future, but we have to frame it somehow so that in 40 minutes you're getting uh, enough meat. And let me start with the fact that it's not lost on anybody how many things are conspiring to make it really difficult to be uh, a very good, very profitable publisher these days, right? We've got the post office going out of business. The newsstand industry hasn't reinvented itself in several decades. You have only to go to the newsstand retail uh, conference, which used to be about 2,000 people, now about 250 people, and they all still wear lots of gold chains. <laughs> but that's not a, an editorial comment on anybody. Um, and then we've got that crack-like addiction to advertising, which caused us to keep up very high circulation levels, um, which really weren't terribly profitable. So we, we though, have trailblazed. We are paving the way for a future, and my incredible panelists are going to be talking about that uh, with us today. So I have the honor of being joined, as you already heard from the voice of God, um, by Phil Weiser, CTO of Hearst. Um, both of these gentlemen, I should s preface a little bit, started and did amazing things in music. And, um, so. you know, they were reminding me that that was a whole lot harder because of the model changing overnight, and it made me feel much calmer after talking to them both, that, wow, that was really hard. This is not a big deal. So let's just put our big girl pants on and get moving in this transformation. Um, so... Um, we didn't say it quite like that. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't, because I, I run HR at Dwell Media, so I... Um, at any rate... Uh, back to Phil. So also was CTO of Sony, um, had started his own company, Liquid Audio, um, and then um, Kevin Conroy, um, president of Univision Interactive and Enterprise Development, which says a lot about what it is to be really, kind of I'm putting this on your shoulders, you are the person leading the innovation and the transformation. So. Um, what we all have in common, you heard that I'm the CEO of Dwell Media. I am definitely the, the little speedboat around these two battleships. Um, but we have 10 platforms and we have spent uh, the 14 years that we've been in business literally focusing on a community of people, not on a platform. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the fact that the three of us have a lot in common from the standpoint of we're in violent agreement that we have world-class brands amazing communities of very loyal people engaged in those brands, and content en engines that are journalistically at the top of their game and arguably are the reason why people come to those brands in the first place. So why haven't we led the way you know, from the beginning? What, what really have been some of those challenges? Well, transformation is on the way, and what I will pose to my panelists is, given that one could say the brass ring is the confluence of content, community, and commerce, what is it that you're doing to lead the way, uh, Phil, and why haven't we been the forerunners? I mean, why haven't we been the trailblazers at first, and, and what are you doing to, to do that? And maybe you can talk about the nine trends that you've identified that affect sure, publishing. Sure. Well, I, was, I joined Hearst about two years ago, and I, I, I'm the CTO, but I kind of view myself as a bit of an entrepreneur in residence as well. And it was the first time that Hearst 
had brought in someone to look across all their media properties. We have broadcast television stations, about 29, that cover 23% of the US population. We've got many of the top magazine brands in the world, from Cosmopolitan to L onward. Um, and then we, we also have a, a large number of newspaper businesses. And, and what the company recognized was that all these businesses were converging. And the technology and societal shifts that were hitting all of us were going to transform all of these businesses in very similar ways. And in fact, these businesses that were distinguished previously by the mode of communication to the consumer were all going to have the same mode of communication in the future. So we had to really think about what the core value proposition was to our audience going forward. So what I do in the company is look at these major technological trends the cloud coming in. So we think about the cloud, it's some amorphous discussion about compute moving out into the network. But what that means is that new entrants have very low barriers to entry to come online. So you think about um, uh, Greenwald, who had released the Snowden documents. It was about eight weeks ago that Pierre Amadeir, who was one of the founders of, um, of eBay, got together and said, I want to start a new news organization. Eight weeks later, they launched this product in the market. So it's amazing how quickly our competitors are springing up with, with interesting new forms of content. And that's the sort of thing where, as, as a number one goal for, for Hearst in general, I always talk about one thing, it's being agile and moving faster and leveraging technology to enable that. And, and that's really what I'm doing across all the businesses and really the key driver for a company has been around this type of innovation. And we look at several trends, one of them is this this lower barrier to entry for, for new entrants. The fact that things like content marketing and native advertising necessitate a breaking down of the barriers between editorial and publishing. So in the, in the journalistic community and certainly in the magazine environment, there's a very rigid wall between sales and content. And you can't live in that world anymore because new entrants don't play by those rules. And they, like companies like BuzzFeed, which fortunately we're an investor in, they, you know, are, are, their core business model is integrating content from brand and advertising partners directly with content that they're creating, and that's how they drive their business because the concept of the ads being here and the content being here is going away. So that move toward content and native advertising is a big trend. Another one's video. You can't be a publisher and you can't communicate with consumers unless you've got video as a core part of your communication mode. So we have to integrate video into everything that we're doing. The other um, big trend is around data, and we'll talk a bit about that as well. The, the, the publishers and, and people that reach out to consumers have to be much smarter than they've ever been. Consumers have a very high expectation that you will understand what they want when they land on your page. Independent of how they got there, you have to be very powerful with data, and that plays into what's happening with advertising. The big trend is programmatic. Mm -hmm. Well, now, you know, uh, we're seeing a dramatic shift in the advertising market where our large direct sales teams are com competing with open exchanges of advertising. We have to be much more effective at sort of selling our properties in this new way, in this new medium. So the, you know, the trends of data, what it means in terms of personalization, that all comes together on the devices as well. And this shift to mobile is unbelievable. In the last 18 months, across our properties. We've seen mobile traffic go from, I think it's 20%, 30%. It's crossed over the 50% point across all of Hearst's 200 million or so unique users every month. And so it's a seismic shift in the way you deliver content because now they're not only on mobile devices, they've got new types of devices and displays and you know, things like um, Google Glass that have been coming out potentially could impact the market as well. So this, this mobile shifts the, the way that you deliver program in a very fundamental way. So we're looking at all of that. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, I think larger media companies, uh, multi-brand or otherwise, I think do have some inherent challenges that you know pure plays don't. And having having worked, um, you know, on a couple of different sides of this, um, rights holder, pure play, etc., um, it's been interesting to, to watch how it evolves. But ultimately, I think um, the the approach that we've taken uh, is that it, I think it was appropriate, say, 10 years ago, seven years ago, um, for the, quote, call it digital activities, to, to be in a place where you could have some folks who were really immersed in that space, developing best practices, learnings, to then share with you know, larger groups of people. 
Um, and I think, you know, those, I think those days are just completely over. Um, I, I think today success has to be uh, really defined as digital DNA throughout the fabric of the entire company, and, and I mean entire company, functionally and, and otherwise. And if you start with that orientation, I think it helps to inform kind of how you come at this. So, you know, our, our view is that, you know, as a, as a multi-brand company that happens to enjoy a, a pretty unique position with regard to the Hispanic media landscape, um, you know, we, we, we look at it and say, well, really the mission is to, to evolve, transform the company to becoming a modern media company and everything that modern means. You know, and if you have to talk about cross-platform, it gets awkward. Um, and, and I think it's also every new generation of technology is an opportunity to step back and really rethink your business, or at least look, look differently at the paradigm. And so for us, it wasn't about taking um, successful networks, whether they be broadcast or cable, and simply extending them to new platforms. For us, it was an opportunity to step back and actually self-aggregate. So we created you know, one digital video product um, uh, that offers all of the content from across all 14 of our networks um, in one fully bilingual experience in one place. And, and we thought that that was a better way to serve the audience, a better way to achieve scale, a better way to concentrate our efforts. And then uh, and that's called uh, Uvideos. And we did the same thing for audio, uh, a product called Euphoria. And they've really become the organizing principles, if you will, for how we then really motivate you know, the, our entire company around an, a different way of thinking about how to express our content in a digital age. You know, the other big one, Phil just mentioned mobile. You know, mobile, as I'm sure everyone knows, sort of is a phenomena that, that you know, the US was sort of the last uh, to, to get on the bandwagon. And, and so um, Hispanics in the United States have, have really been behaving for 10, 15 years more like the European market, uh, pan, you know, uh, Pan-Asia and, and, and Latin America, in that the mobile device was the primary means of communication. So uh, that's why, as the markets become increasingly mobile, uh, we've, we've enjoyed a unique position because it's really almost like the market's coming to us as opposed, as opposed to us you know, going to the market. And so we've, we've tried to think about how we approach content differently, um, how we think about community differently. Um, there's, you know, one, one that's, thing that's kind of interesting is for us, you know, 94% of our viewership is still live, um, predominantly because it's a lot of primetime novellas, a tremendous amount of football, meaning soccer, um, and that's multi-generational viewing. And, and so one could argue that because the vast majority of our viewing is, is, is still live, you know, why are we so focused on digital, right? And the answer is because we, we see it as this is the time for us to extend our footprint fully um, with a very simple mantra that if we have a branded content experience available everywhere that our audience is, then they have the option to choose us. If we don't, they don't have the option to choose us. So, you know, it, it, it it can be complicated, we can make it complicated, but at the end of the day, I think media is really about brands, it's about brand creation, it's about curation, and I think we've seen that one of three things happens with every new platform, uh, and that is that brands that embrace everything that technology has to offer can get stronger, uh, and we've seen great examples of that. Brands that don't atrophy and die, we've seen examples of that, um, and entirely new brands you know, emerge to, uh, to serve audiences that are otherwise not being served. And we've seen this since you know, the 1930s with, with radio, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I look at it as, I, I'm, I'm genuinely excited because I feel like unlike the experiences that we had some years ago uh, uh, in the music business where it seemed to happen overnight, it seemed to be completely disruptive in what was you know, really a kind of a primitive business model, yes, right? Yeah. Um, you know, today I think we're, we're in a much better place because I think people have a, a much different level of understanding and appreciation for what it, what it provides to the end user. 
And, and, and I think that that's the, the, then the goal becomes, OK, how do you work out the technology decisions and the business model decisions ultimately to serve the user, knowing that there's a large number of users to serve. So it's not like you're trying to create the consumer market. The consumer market's there. And as long as you stay in it, I think you, you have an, uh, a really inherent advantage. You know, you said one thing that I think is really powerful there. First of all, it, it's kind of, if you, you look at our history in music, it's kind of like we get a do-over now, you know, to, to, to go after the publishing exactly. industry with that, that experience. But one thing that's really important that, to get to the point of why I think the traditional media companies have had a hard time moving first um, is because they, they view these new platforms as distribution. And they don't go deep enough and go into the fact that this is not just about changing distribution or marketing. It's about changing the product and fundamentally changing the way you create the content for that new medium. And an example are magazines on the tablet, right? So when the magazine industry saw the iPad come out, they're like, great, we've got a replacement for paper. And they just built the same thing and threw it onto glass with the same experience. And it's kind of like in the first days of film, right? They just put a camera in front of the stage and put on a play, and that right. was the medium. Um, we haven't really transcended that as an industry yet. And I have this sort of dream of a high-def, streaming, interactive magazine experience. And you know, we're getting there, but it's not, it's not something that's made it all the way through the editorial process, as you know. And that's, right. that's a fundamental shift. So getting to you know, Kevin's yeah. comment about digital DNA, saying you're going to be digital first or you're going to be mobile first, but still, when you go back to the editorial suite, you're creating to optimize the image you're putting on the newsstand to drive newsstand sales. That's a bit what we went through in the music industry, where the whole promotion department was geared around getting a disc jockey to spin a single. And then it's well, one thing we did in the music industry, say, well, you're not going to go to Tower Records anymore. You're going to go to Cupertino and figure out how you're going to get promotion on that new platform. And I think that shift in editorial and sales is something that the industry, traditional companies, haven't quite grappled with yet. And I think the publishing community, all forms of publishing, um, I think could legitimately make the case some years ago that there were some very specific sort of technological impediments. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, that that was legitimate for a period of time. I don't, I don't think that argument holds at all today. Uh, I, I, think that, I, I don't think the issue really, while, while obviously technology will continue to evolve, um, I think there are some really fantastic solutions, both that have been you know, developed in-house, third party. Um, I'm a big believer in third party solutions. Um, so I, I just don't think that that's any, anywhere close to being the gating issue it once, were, once was. So it really shines the spotlight squarely on the decisions that I think the publishing community really can control. So there's no, you can't play dodgeball anymore, right? right. I mean, there, there's, no, there's no rock to hide under anymore because now it's really about, okay, how, how are you going to extend your brand value proposition? How are you going to serve the audience the way the audience wants to be served? How are you going to build products with great design? And ultimately, how are you going to you know, be able to measure and monetize those experiences however you choose to, to monetize? Um, and I think, the, I think that should squarely be the focus of the discussion, less so you know, on, on the technology side, only because I think the technology community has done a pretty terrific job developing a set of solutions that allow publishers to scale whatever choices they make. You know, one, one interesting, if I can just build on that, one, one interesting thing about motivation uh, in the, the music industry, going back to that again, one thing I had to do at Sony Music when I was building the digital business there was create a, basically a parallel billboard chart because all the record label heads only looked at billboard and they only cared about where they were on that chart and digital wasn't counted. So I had to create a digital chart and run around and say, hey, you know, Warner's doing better than you are on digital right now, and that's something we're all going to measure against. And I think that that's a big issue for the industry is how are we incented and, yeah. and measured. And, there's a, and, and I think there's a, there's a little bit of a temptation that I would encourage pro publishers to don't bite, um, and that is that there's a little bit of a lowering of the bar. And, and so in the interest of gaining scale, there's a, there's a little bit of, of people willing to sort of lower their standards in order to accommodate whatever the set of circumstances are, whether it be the demands of an advertiser or, or otherwise. Um, and I think you see it now because just as, just as the industry was getting to a point where there, were, there have been some and are some reasonable standards for how to go about engaging and, and monetizing in a measurable way, you, you see two big movements in the publishing community, one of which 
Phil touched on, which is you know the ferocious pace at which programmatic is is sort of you know exploding across the landscape. And programmatic means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it's it's really algorithmically you know driven buying and selling right mm -hmm. at, at its core. Now the the great promise was that it would really find you know water would find its level, and that it would have an accretive effect. Um, not just not not just a devaluing effect on on inventory. The reality is today we're seeing more we're seeing CPMs go down more than they're going up, and and th and then what you find is people trying to counter that by embracing things like native advertising. And there are a lot of different flavors of native advertising, but it really means custom content to to deliver to an audience and experience to serve you know, a, mar a marketer's uh, objectives. And so you see this tension of you know, the, the sort of algorithmic forces driving down the value of inventory and publishers then trying to compensate for that by trying to create these native experiences to support you know, premium. And all I would say is at the end of the day, you know, my perspective is premium wins. Um, and, and, there's, and there's, uh, there's sort of a shocking dynamic where I think people are, are moving in a, in a direction away from premium because they're trying to keep pace. And ultimately, as, we, as we've seen through various cycles, I, I, th I think that I think premium experiences, my bet is premium experiences win over time. Um, and you really got to resist the forces that want to drag you down to the lowest common denominator. So I want to also add to the editorial piece of this because you know, there's the American Society of Magazine Editors, there's the <clears throat> magazine, used to be Magazine Publishers Association. Mm -hmm. It's now the Association of Magazine Media Professionals. Isn't that right? I have no I, idea. I, I mean, <laughs> go with it. <laughs> right. And their whole goal is to help the industry navigate rough waters from postal reform all the way to the codes of ethics for journalism. And in many ways, those very things have been the reins or the bridle on our ability to move forward in a demonstrable way. Because there was um, always great conversation at the American Magazine Conference and at the uh, digital summits that, you know, we have to protect that content. We have to protect journalism. We have to protect, you know, what really is content and not paid advertising. And we've spent so much time protecting it that we truly stopped leading the way. And so now we're being dragged into it, um, whether we like it or not. And I think that we now see, certainly with both of your companies and a few others, um, a, a real path forward that isn't like a zero-sum game. It's not like, okay, well, we're just giving up and there's really no such thing as objective reporting and honest to God journalism and, and editorial. It's just all you know, kind of thinly veiled well, I think the news, advertising. I think the news field is particularly challenged. It is. Um, because the whole sort of definition of what's news and, and how, you know, and, and basic news practices like fact checking, you know. Um, I think that's why you've seen the emergence of organizations like the News Literacy Org, which mm -hmm. is, I think, doing a great job of trying to, you know, educate uh, at you know, high schools and colleges and sort of bring back you know, find the right balance because it's, you know, it, we are in a very different kind of news gathering and reporting environment technologically, but that doesn't mean that that, that basic fact checking has to go away, right. you know? Well, as a journalism major, I uh, am now on the board of the Cal Poly Journalism School because I do see it as a dying art. What I want to do is help reframe the fact that we're not trying to stop the innovation, we're just trying to understand how it, where, the, where its place is and still have a good future. But let's, um, let's go to the fact that just even between your two companies, we're talking about literally hundreds of millions of eyeballs across all your platforms. Mm -hmm. Let's add me and then we get a hundred million plus a couple million if you add dual media. Um, so there's so much to be learned, right? And if we talk about the promise of big data, which you probably, that's not lost on any of you here. It's a discussion in, across multiple industries. But we've got an opportunity to understand everything about our communities, right? And even if we're about home or architecture, I want to know what scotch they drink, what running shoes they wear, how they vacation, where they vacation, cars they drive, homes they own. 
Um, so we're rapidly trying to get all of that across all of our platforms. Um, tell me, you know, Phil, you actually had a great graphic on your site about this, like big data and kind of what's worth it and what's not. So is it just, um, is it all it cra is cracked up to be? Tell us. I think it's the, the most important area to focus energy if you're thinking about your audience. Because I view our job is connecting our audience with content. That's what we do. You know, and we create great content that hopefully they'll enjoy once they get there. And you know, so the focus of big data is it's a, it's a very broad term going from you know, the exhaust coming off of all the interactions you have from the quantified self. But at the end of the day, as a publisher, I really just care about what you're interested in and give me some context for how I'm going to deliver content to you. And that content may be advertising. And that really focused the discussion in Hearst on phase one of big data, um, which was around audience. So what we did is we wired up every single web property, online property, app, mobile solution in the entire company, several hundred um, distinct businesses. And it was, you know, as I said, you know, close to 200 million uniques globally across the different businesses. And we have all of that pumping into one big database. It's about 600 million transactions per day, different ways that we touch our consumers. And then we merge that with other data about those consumers to better understand who they are. And, and that drives the advertising and the product creation in the company. And it's been very effective. So one thing we did was we created what's called a trading desk. Because of the shift to programmatic, you have to be very smart going into what is equivalent of a stock exchange and saying, I've got this person here. They're very interested in automobiles. And match that with an advertiser who's willing to pay a higher price. And you have to do all of that in a matter of milliseconds. So we've built a lot of infrastructure in the company around connecting that real-time consumer with the content that we have within the company. The other element is around personalization. And this is really important because the way consumers find our content is fundamentally different. The way I explain this in the company is, when you think about a web property, we used to think about it like a house, right? So the, you'd have a home page, and that was the front door. And people would open the front door and walk into the house, and they could go to different rooms. And you'd lay it out for them, and it was a great experience coming in through the front door. Well, fast forward to social media now. We have people basically that you're sitting in a bedroom, somebody pops up in the bedroom out of nowhere, and now you have to deliver an experience to them. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know what they want. So when they pop into your bedroom, it's like, well, are you sleepy? I'll deliver you some good nighttime reading. Are you feeling a little sexy? I'll throw some Cosmo out there for you. Um, but you have to really think about it as every interaction is real time. You have no idea what they're coming in for. And as we look at social, because that the way you engage the consumer is coming in many different ways that are out of your control, we have to rethink the way that we engage that consumer. And in particular, when they drop in, we need to know just simple things. Has this person ever been here before? And if they've been here before, then we know what they're interested in. And we're going to present a different experience to them based on that. If they've never been here before, we're going to try and promote and engage them to learn more about our brand. So that audience data, to me, is job number one in the company right now. OK. And let's talk about measurement as it regards data. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I love how much uh, attention data has, uh, the sort of renewed attention that data is getting since we put the word big in front of it. Um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, but, but appropriately so. I mean, the, the reality is that, um, look, I, I think the publishing community actually uh, some years ago cre you know, kind of created the, the predicament that we're in right now because you know, it, was, it was some years ago when publishers you know, wanted to try to monetize all their inventory. They took the unsold inventory and they, and they made it available to third parties, originally you know, first generation ad networks to monetize that inventory. And of course, that dynamic ultimately is, is what we are living with today in programmatic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now the same publishers that sort of created the dynamic um, are, are not happy about that um, and trying to figure out how to, how to now, you know, in some ways, put the genie back in the bottle. Well, that's not easy to do, right? But what is, I think, um, practical for publishers to do is for them to make different decisions going forward about how they're going to manage first party relationships. And I think over a reasonable amount of time, you can change the dynamic. And I think that those choices are up to at scale publishers. Um, uh, and by, by at scale, I mean you know, established, new, et cetera, to be able to think differently about how you engage first party, how you work with a variety of third parties to enrich that data 
but do it all through the lens of how you're serving that user. Um, and you've got to be just very careful about it because just at a time when we're, I think, in a position to make some good decisions, to take some good actions that will enable us to actually deliver more value based on, on what that user opts into in terms of characteristics, et cetera, is the same time that now we're dealing with a lot of bad players. Um, and there, there, is, you know, there is a meaningful amount of bad stuff going on, um, which kind of muddies the, the water. Um, but, I, but I think that the, I, I honestly, I think that the, that the publishing community is in a position to make a real difference here, but this is one where I think the community really needs to work together in the appropriate ways to move this forward um, and, and put us in a better position to be able to measure what matters. So to your point about measurement, you know, the good news is it's come a fair, a fair distance. I personally feel like the digital industry um, made a big mistake about 15 years ago in, in setting itself up as something standalone in contrast to other types of media. Um, and I think the minute that decision was made and that dynamic was created that, that the digital industry and that there was going to be a digital economy that was going to compete with traditional media economies, I think it was a mistake, and, and I think we're dealing with all of that now, because ultimately, of course, you know, no, no consumer, um, uh, I would imagine, certainly not anyone in this room, spends all their life on one form of media. Right. The reality is that it's a blended experience across device, across platform. That's always been the case, even going back to the days of you know, traditional radio and linear television. Um, so the notion that you know, people were going to compartmentalize their lives was flawed at the outset, and, 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 and the measurement path sort of began down that trail, right? And, and now we're at a point where we're actually really trying hard to, I think, look at things more holistically, which is the only way to really measure what's going on, and to understand the accretive effect of one form of media on another. And I think the real value creation is in being able to discern what is accretive. And so, you know, my, my plea is for, for all of us in, in, engaged in, in value creation on, on whatever side of the table we sit, let's, let's shift the dialogue, let's shift our attention, let's shift what's happening in the measurement community to focus on and discern what's accretive and get out of the business of trying to, you know, set one form of media up against the other because I don't, I don't think anyone, I, I, I think I don't think anyone wins uh, in the end with that approach. Well, and not to mention the fact that all of our companies and many many other companies not here are all about creating these solutions across all platforms and not selling, you know, banners and pages and booths if you have events, but really being able to put together meaningful programs that give a partner demonstrable evidence that, that what you're doing with the brand or brands really does work. Yeah. And so then trying to break that all up and say, no, 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 we're going to measure this bucket this way and, you know, kind of put it back to a Chinese menu. Well, dollars go to eyeballs, right? I mean, right. You have, let's say do dollars go to targeted eyeballs, right? right? Mm -hmm. And right. The, the, ability, the ability to truly measure that in a way that's, you know, that's sustainable, I think is, you know, it, it continues to be a little bit of a challenge. I mean, we know we can see it and we see it, you know, every day where we, we see an increasing amount of media consumption happening on a variety of different devices. And yet, you know, I, I, I'm glad that the, that the big, you know, measurement organizations are, are really addressing this, but it's not happening fast enough, right? Because, you know, we're all, we're, I'm sure we're all using tablets to consume media. It, it won't be until the end of this year, 2014, um, that tablets are measured for the first time mm -hmm. um, with respect to program viewership. Right, Isn't that crazy? so, so it is. So you know, it's it's a little bit of a, a a mixed situation because I think it's, you know, consumers are there, the eyeballs are there, um, content, you know, producers, creators, distributors are increasingly making an effort to make, you know, that value available in the way that consumers want to consume. You know, the the remaining pieces of the puzzle is how do you measure that value? How do you assign value? And then how do you how do the dollars flow in a way that you know that represents that? Mm -hmm. And and a lot of that's tied to a lot of that's uh, tied to measurement. 
Okay, so I knew this would happen. We have an incredible discussion going here, and um, we've got about six minutes left, and I really want there to be some Q&A. But in one minute, each of you, one minute, and I'm going to somehow have, you know, have to hit you with my cards. Um, please tell us uh, what Hearst and Univision, res respectively, um, look like in 2017. How far in a transformation have you gone? Well, I, th I think a, a media company can't survive going forward without technology at the core. And I'm biased, and that's you know, what I do. But I, I believe you know, this previous stratification of media companies by function has to break down into small little packs of people chasing down opportunities. And you know, the, the, you know in, in Utopia is a world where we have our sales team, our editors, our publishers, and our content teams all working in unison to create great experiences in real time. And um, breaking down those walls has been very challenging. So one thing I did when I came into Hearst, you know, I said, you know, I, I run the product development, but also the IT. I said, job one is we're going to kill IT. We're going to kill IT in the whole company. We're not going to do that anymore. We're out of the IT business. All technology people in this company are going to either be touching a consumer or a customer, or you don't have a role. And I think that integrated world is really the future of media companies. OK. I think, we've, um, I think we've sort of successfully crossed the, the midpoint. Um, I, I think we're fortunate because we, we, we do have a, you know, our, our, our CEO is our biggest champion, um, and that really does make a, a big difference. Um, I think I can say without exception that the entire leadership team um, is, is fully committed to making this you know, transition and really understands you know, where, where we're headed and why. Um, I, I, think the, I think the personality of the company, the flavor of the company, um, uh, will, become, uh, will become increasingly multi-brand. Um, I, 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 you know, I see us continuing to nurture the, the, the relationship that we have, which is unique, um, with, uh, with the Spanish dominant segment of uh, the Hispanic community, and increasingly, and becoming increasingly relevant to the bilingual community um, by virtue of all of the things that we're doing with our brand strategy and technology, et cetera. So I think we're, I, I think we're doing the right things. I would just say that, you know, I'm sure everyone feels this way. I just feel like, you know, we, it, can't ha it can't happen fast That's enough, tonight. you know. Um, and so, you know, you wake up in the morning with a punch list and the punch list, you know, used to be 30 items and, and now it's 72 items, you know what I mean? But so it's, you just got to keep pushing really, really, really hard. Um, but I, I, you know, we'll go back to where you started. I mean, I, I really think relative to some of the experiences that we and perhaps others had um, in and around, you know, the days of, of uh, you know, Naps, when Napster was going to take over the world and MP3 was going to take over the world and Nutella was going to take over the world, you know, we've come a long way, I think, as a media industry community, um, and, and, uh, and I'm encouraged because at the end of the day, I think we're taking the right steps to ultimately serve consumers ourselves in the way we all want to be served because we are consumers, right? Okay. All right. Do I have questions? I don't. I can keep going. But you, oh, good. Sir, right here. Wait for your microphone, please. Thank you. Thanks. Phil, you mentioned uh, wearable devices and uh, Google Glass even as a possible platform for publishing. So the, you just started getting up to speed on the uh, tablet and smartphone. So how do you see that taking shape over the next few years? Yeah, I think um, mobile is going to a whole nother level. So you know, I, I did an R&D experiment with Google Glass last year where we took Elle magazine and tried to reformat and make it relevant for Google Glass, which is this heads-up display where you have text popping up at random points in time throughout the day. And the, the challenge to the editors was kind of like a Twitter challenge. How are you going to engage that user when you have a few seconds and you only have a Twitter-like amount of text and build a new experience around that? And I think that real-time integration that's con you know, contextual in the sense it's geo, like, hey, you just walked by that store and we just did an article in Harper's Bazaar on that dress that you're seeing in the window. Being able to engage at that micro level, that's going to be really important going forward. And it ties back into the data aspect of this as well, of knowing what's relevant to the consumer. Right. Yes. Microphone here. 
it's sort of <clears throat> confessions of a content creator time. It's confusing. I think it was the CEO of Vivo yesterday who was saying that, you know, there's like a new, it's not just a short film, it's like a new kind of product <laughs> for online. And I think, can you speak to what kind of, I mean, you used to be able to write on spec, like word count, or there were certain formats for short films and feature films, obviously. So can you kind of uh, sort out the confusion between what's coming and how you guys are setting the parameters? From a content perspective? Yeah. So I, 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 think, the, I think the mistake is people are trying to you know, figure out, like, what's the one type of content that's going to be successful in digital? And the answer is... Um, but it's not one, right? So in the same way that, you know, the television industry has enjoyed, you know, new primetime pilots and, and long-running success with syndication and et cetera, et cetera, there's been a mix of different types of content across, you know, the life of the various windows of exploitation. I think something similar plays, plays out because there's, a, of course, a whole generation of consumption around the ability to have access to primetime programming and being able to consume it different, differently, uh, and we're seeing that firsthand. We're also seeing you know, the success of originally produced long form. Um, I don't think it all has to be you know, quite as expensive as some of the stuff that is getting a lot of attention. Um, I think in some ways that that's you know, setting the bar too high for, for what needs, you know, it, it's, it's, really about, it's, re it's really about originally scripted programming um, I, I, I don't think it needs to be overproduced. There'll be years to sweeten the productions in the future. Um, I think it's more about concept-driven programming and shorter and shorter length programming. We've been experimenting with you know 15 episode, six minute, you know, uh, uh, um, you know originally scripted for a couple of years. Um, we we actually just announced as a company. Uh, a new initiative, a uh, studio to focus specifically on digital content um, that will be shorter form. Um, so it's a, I, think, I think the answer is it's a mix, and if you force me, I'd, I'd say right now it's three types. It's, uh, it's, it's long form programming that will enjoy new windows of consumption. It's ancillary content around stuff that people are really passionate about, um, which is you know, kind of a fancy way of saying you know, the DVD extras of 15 years ago, um, which continue to be incredibly relevant around shows that people are passionate about, and originally produced short form programming that can either tie to the storyline of full length scripted or be completely standalone and independent. And if I were, if I were you know, betting you know, my own personal money, I'd, I'd bet on those three. You know, just an example of that, just interesting, this blur between film and television. We just uh, produced a miniseries, The Bible, with Mark Burnett, it's one of our, our companies. And um, it just recently, we took the miniseries that aired on television, we recut it as a movie, and we're releasing it this month as a movie. So the, the lines between these mediums is really getting mixed up. So I'm as confused as yeah. you are. I mean, one of our originally, <laughs> one of our originally produced, um, one of our originally produced, uh, uh, you know, sort of short novellas for the web, um, uh, ran as ran as a 15-part, six-minute. Uh, and, and then we and then we edited it as a 60-minute, you know, show for prime time. Okay, we have ch uh, time for one more question. Yes, you had your hand up. I used to be associate publisher of a magazine that was very successful and didn't go digital fast enough, so it doesn't exist anymore. But I love magazines, and I subscribe to about 20. The business model that's confusing me is I subscribe to the magazine and I get it in print and some magazines want me to pay for an additional digital magazine to see the same issue on my iPad. Now it seems like gradually everything is going to transition over to the iPad and no paper, but why do they think that people are willing to pay twice for the same item instead of giving that away and gradually getting rid of the paper? And I get many of Hearst's magazines, by the way. Yeah. This is an ongoing debate inside of our company. Um, I call it the clawback, right? So uh, the magazine industry in search of greater circulation basically gave away subscriptions. And now we're in a situation where we'd like to claw that back and get those rates back up. And it's, you know, it's, it's an active debate. So you know, myself and David Carey runs magazines and others are reviewing that. But I think, you know, I, at the end of the day, you buy a brand, you want access to that experience across multiple screens, and that should flow freely. 
Um, but this, you know, this shift is a challenging one. And um, I think you know, one uh, challenge that's facing all the industries is the fact that every medium is converging toward advertising and subscriptions. And the concept of buying and owning media, I think, you know, by the end of you know the decade, will probably certainly be down dramatically. You mean like micro micro payments? Well, just or... buying a magazine, right. buying a song. As we see the iTunes numbers right. start to drop for yeah. a permanent permanent ownership of media is going to go away. You know, it's interesting. We we you know we we actually saw this some years ago, right? When when the digital download you know first kind of came on the scene with music, you know, if you just if you just thought logically. You know the, the the whole idea of bringing something resident to a device made sense then because you know you couldn't count on high quality streaming you know anywhere at any time, but logically over the arc of time, if if you could stream something high quality regardless of you know device geography etc. and have instant access to it through a streaming model, why would you ever download anything, right? And and you and you're starting to see that although the pendulum has swung. Because at one time, everyone felt like, no, 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 I want, that resi I want whatever that piece of content is to be resident on my device, when it doesn't really matter whether it's resident to, on your device as long as you can access it instantly whenever you want. The other thing, let me just add that um, one of the reasons that magazines are doing that is because they're in the midst of this shift of what is considered uh, again, an antiquated way of selling advertising, and that's rate base. So in order to do that, and digital subscriptions do count in the audit, but they count only if they're paid. So they don't now count unless the publisher says, you're paying $30 for your magazine and owe five of that, and they have to state that, is for the tablet. If they don't, then, they don't, then they're not allowed to count it. Again, it's kind of an antiquated method, and they should just be giving you access, but that the, goes back to this whole measurement and the way in which we do things. Well, so, the challenge is, right, if you make it frictionless, then you have the opportunity to capture 100% of the addressable audience right. onto a new platform. Right. If you introduce friction, you're going to get breakage. Well, they're so, going to go to a different magazine medium that's geared toward that experience. It's exactly. not going to be us, so it's a real challenge. Okay, so we're about six minutes over, and I'm sure that our panelists are hanging around for a few minutes before we take planes home. But thank you so very much. I hope this has been helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Both. Thank you to the State of the Publishing Industry panelists.